from 6.5% of GDP to 4.5% of GDP. So not such a big jump, 6.5 to 4.5, 4 except when we think about we're talking 5% of the entire U.S. economy and saying that he's intending to slash Medicare by a third. That's really what it comes down to. Whereas some of the program effects wouldn't be felt necessarily. He says, you know, if you're under 55 or a certain age, these, uh, these changes in the benefits won't affect you immediately. But because Ryan and Romney are also saying that they're going to get rid of the Affordable Care Act, it means that these Medicare Advantage plans and the current inflationary uh, policies that are in place will continue apace. Now, because of the Affordable Care Act, Medicare and uh, the, the uh, fiscal sustainability of Medicare was extended for eight years. So it's now going to be salvaged at least till 2024. If you take that back, that means that the Medicare program starts to crumble immediately. If you take away the, the props that are available through the Affordable Care Act, even if you don't go to the voucher system, you undermine all the things that are in place in the Affordable Care Act to sustain Medicare while we're moving forward to a higher degree of sustainability, if that makes sense. Let me just say quickly, um, in addition to the wonderful work that um, Planned Parenthood is doing, that uh, health care providers are doing around the country, and particularly in this area, I want to just throw out a couple of numbers. 99% of heterosexually active couples use birth control. 97% of the care at a, a Planned Parenthood is primary care, 97 or 98% basic health care for people. 30% of women will have an abortion at some time in their lives. We are a majority movement. The majority of the House of Representatives right now is anti-choice. We are three votes away from an anti-choice majority in the Senate. The, sen the sentiment that we don't want these folks coming into our home, I think that there's a call, a need, and the mechanisms for a united and vigorous voice, including this January when the folks come here again, as they have been doing for the last couple of years. Don't need to tangle with them. It's not the only reason we're doing with it. Doing it. But it is an opportunity for us to stand up and say, we are San Franciscans, and we are San Francisco, and we do have an opinion on this matter. So, Thank you. One quick question for Alan. No, okay. Let me go. My question for Ken is, yeah, you, you, you eloquently talked about Occupy and, and the attack against unions and bigger class sizes and stuff like that. What is the state of at labor for education for public school teachers right now here in California? Well, the public schools and public school unions are, are not an island unto ourselves. So the first thing, uh, the first point is that the mighty, mighty California Teachers Association has lost 40,000 members in the last couple of years. So in terms of the strength of our union, it's being diminished. And, and, and um, the labor movement itself and, and teachers in spe specifically have been the brunt of perhaps the most um, uh, broad-based ongoing onslaught of the corporate media of any group of professionals perhaps in American history. And I, I would challenge anyone here to find a group that's been more under attack public school teachers over the last quarter of a century. And if you remember the first Bush administration labeled teacher unions as terrorists. And I forget the guy's name, but um, it was the Secretary of Education under the, under the first Bush. Perhaps. But he, yeah. So, so the state of public education unions, teachers and otherwise, like other public employee unions, is that we're under attack. Quite frankly, we're on the defensive, and that's why in California, it's so important that we win Prop 30 and defeat Prop 32. Prop 32 is Wisconsin and California, and it's Mitt Romney's plan for the nation. If you read the Republican Party platform, which I wrote today in preparation for this evening, 
you will see in, in polite language that what they are offering is the decimation of the American labor movement. And how do you do that? You go after the public employee unions. If you, over the last 30 years, uh, the, union, the percentage of unionized working people has gone basically from about a third to about 10 percent, 11 percent. Most of those are public employee unions. Why the assault on teacher unions? And again, I, I alluded to this earlier. It's because the American Federation of Teachers and the National Education Association for all of our human imperfections as, as mass organizations are the bulwark against the 1% agenda to corporatize the totality of American life. Because AFT and NEA not only support a public school system based on some reasonable progressive taxation, if you look at reproductive right fights, national um, uh, health care fights, environmental regulations, if you look at um, fights over civil rights and voter fraud and all that stuff, you will find 99% of the time that AFT and NEA stand with the 99%. And so, so we're fighting a real guard movement, and I would just say one thing, that the great thing about the Occupy movement is that it put the great economic discrepancies facing the country on the agenda. And perhaps the last boulder, the last um, um, really um, deep pool of the American Commonwealth is the public school system. Most Americans still believe in the public schools, even as we know the rewards and all. And most people still love teachers. But the corporate agenda has succeeded in tarnishing the image of, of teacher unions. And, and but, I, but I would challenge anyone to go into a public school system and really tear us apart. Uh, and I would use myself as an example. I mean, I was a classroom teacher for 25 years in San Francisco, and, and now I've emerged into a kind of a leadership position. But every leader of UESF was in the classroom at least two decades. Our president, Dennis Kelly, taught for almost 40 years. So teachers and our union are indivisible. What the corporations are trying to do is tarnish union so much that teachers and our students are defenseless, and we cannot allow them to privatize the public schools, and they're this close to doing it. A voucher system would be disaster for the kids that they are professing to give aid to, because again, I'll, I'll use the term, I'll create a kind of educational apartheid based on class in this country of the likes we have never seen. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause for this wonderful time. We're going, to, we're going to have a shift. We want you guys to stay and hear from Occupy. So please hang around. Maybe we'll have some questions for Occupy. Finish your sausage and order something to eat or drink. So I'm going to turn the program over to Peter Ron to uh, convene the Occupy panel. Okay, thanks, Tom. Could um, Jane and um, Clark uh, come up to the uh, table? No to speak to people. Generally I do so on a, mostly a one-to-one -one level and I actually interact with normal people and talk to them about Occupy and about economic disparity and about their uh, retirement plans. So that's where the, the, uh, the subject generally turns out. How much did you pay for your house? Are you able to afford it? Is it underwater? Um, you have kids that are going to college? Oh. Are you going to college? Oh, yeah, you expect to pay for it. Anyway. Okay, like, oh, all right. All right um, Many of us um, could um, remember the uh, evolution that um, Occupy um, um, had in the public mind. First it was considered a joke, then it was cons uh, considered an inspiration to uh, those of us who um, had seen um, economic inequality in California, uh, in the um, country worsen, but didn't have a voice to uh, uh, talk about it. 
they became um, um, a bad mouth as a social, um, as a magnet for the social grades of society, and then it's um, felt most recently been uh, called in some circles a failure, and others a success. Now, um, here locally, we've had um, Occupy San Francisco splinter um, uh, uh, to some extent, and yet it's been reborn as well. Um, that there have been successes of, from the local Occupy movements. There's been Occupy Burner, which has been stopping um, house foreclosures. And there's been the uh, Satire 17 celebrations in San Francisco, which drew quite a bit of news attention. And um, our media, local media superstar, Jane Smith, will talk about that when the time comes. But on the other hand, um, there's been um, commentators who wonder about the long-term political impact of Occupy. So, um, we're, um, so we're exactly um, does Occupy stand one year later? Uh, our best, um, the best people to talk about are a couple of activists who are involved with Occupy. Um, sitting to my immediate right is Jane Smith, who's with Occupy Bay United. And um, at the far right is uh, Clark Sullivan, also with uh, Occupy Bay Area United. And Yep. So let's start by asking you to talk about um, your involvement with the Occupy movement. How did you start, and, uh, and what have you done in the past? So, hi, I'm Jane, and I have never been an activist. I went to UC Berkeley, I graduated in math and econ double, and I remember when I was an undergrad and walking around, looking at all these people marching around, being like, they're so stupid, I'm just gonna do my work. Um, then I went to UCLA for graduate school, and then I came back to the Bay Area and I started work. And all the whole time while I was in grad school, I was in grad school for math. And it really sucks, I hate math. Trust me, you would hate it. Well, a lot of people hate it. But the thing is, the whole time I'm reading books, right, and I'm reading a lot of economics things, and I noticed that there's this huge heist happening because I saw the whole mortgage-backed securities thing from a mile away. And I knew there was going to be a crisis. I knew there was going to be a crash. Then lo and behold, it comes. And I say, when is the public going to realize that there has been this massive theft. When the bailouts were ordered for um, all the big banks, I was just outraged. But, like I said, I've never been an activist. There was no movement that I could go to because every single thing that activists were doing were hitting all these symptoms instead of the root causes. It was always like, oh, you can help the homeless, or you can fight for a woman's right to choose, or you can be anti-war, but I felt like none of those things really hit the fact that there was a small group of economic and political elite ruling everything. All of those things were just symptoms of a much larger problem, which was the complete takeover of the economic process, of the political process, everything. And so I said, when are people going to raise up? When is this going to happen? And I'm pretty active online, and I was always looking at all the blogs, and then it happened. Occupy Wall Street pops up. Knew about it within a couple days, and I said, this is it. They went to actually occupy Wall Street. They went to actually hit the root cause of this whole mess. Yay! There's got to be something like this in San Francisco. Go online, figure it out, show up in front of the Fed. Also, I have to say that I was very happy that Occupy San Francisco went to the Federal Reserve because the Federal Reserve is the only um, Federal Reserve in the West. And so as San Franciscans, we really should be there representing. And I came there and I've been an activist ever since. So I came in with this whole thing of, I'm against the banks and I want to fight, you know, I'm against the Federal Reserve, we need to, you know, nationalize the Fed, we need to break up the too big to fail banks. And now I'm so much more than that. It's also for labor rights. And I'm also I learned all about the environmental issues, fracking. I didn't even know what fracking was. Now I'm an expert in fracking. Um, there's 
food sovereignty issues, urban farming, occupy the farm. Um, there were uh, race and class issues and police brutality issues. Never was a part of that, but I now I'm writing flyers for shutting down Muni to protest um, racial injustice. So coming Occupy for me has been that you know I a huge growth experience. I feel like I've learned more in the past year than I have for the ten years I was in college. That has been my involvement. Oh, so the groups I'm in. Uh, so we started at Occupy San Francisco, and now we have formed another group called Occupy Bay Area United. Occupy Bay Area United takes a nonviolent stance, so an explicitly nonviolent stance. The Occupy movement has always been largely nonviolent. However, um, it is uh, Occupy Bay Area United has passed at their general assembly the fact that they are nonviolent. Um, and also, I am a part of a, I started a working group called Ideological Liberation Working Group. And all those flyers that you see that we handed out with the wanted cards, um, our group produced that. So what my group does is makes propaganda. But we call it Ideological Liberation. What we do is we write articles, we make cool pamphlets, we make printed materials so that um, it will be catchy, it will catch people's eye, and that they can learn and figure out how exactly we have all been screwed. But in a funny way. So that is my involvement in Occupy. Hello. I've been an activist ever since I was 11, and that's 41 years now, uh, since Kent State. Uh, when I shut off the intercom at my school, got a lot of trouble, was marked as a rebel for the rest of my life, was continually under surveillance, uh, been under surveillance even to this day um, by the authorities. But that doesn't matter because they're a bunch of dummies and they really don't know what they want, so I'm not that more concerned. But um, I was uh, involved in Occupy before it even became Occupy. Uh, I was working with some people in Canada, Toronto, and uh, we were trying to figure out a way that we could manage to win popular opinion on our side. And we looked at the Indignatus movement in, Tahrir, in uh, Spain and in Tahrir Square in Egypt as a, uh, an example of what we could possibly do if we were organizing here in the United States. So lo and behold, I shattered my leg and I was been trapped in this wheelchair for the last couple of years and I'm just finally able to get around without the chair. So. Uh, I'm back on the road again. I just got back from New York City and D.C. Um, I was visiting the occupiers that were there and trying to provide some sort of analysis so we can figure out where to go from the, in the future. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, I uh, do a lot of speaking next, uh, to people in the public, you know, just people I meet on the street all the time. Uh, uh, and then I would tell you that about 95% of the people that I meet support Occupy. They support the economic theories of what we're trying to talk about. And when you have 700 people in the world that control more wealth and more money than the rest of us 7 billion combined, well, there's definitely the system is sick. And, uh, and the fact that, uh, that these 700 people have managed to uh, almost destroy the earth with their businesses and whatever they're doing with fracking, mountaintop removal, deforestation. I mean, I could go, the list is so long, right, that it would make you depressed, right? But... Uh, I've been a struggler all my life, and then a fighter for people's rights, and uh, uh, we've won, uh, I've done many numerous things, um, very successful. We were managed to get uh, free South Africa back in the 80s, uh, managed to get the United States out of Vietnam, and uh, I got involved, I was like really happy with Occupy because I've been waiting for about 10 to 15 years for the young people in this country to do something. Because when I was a young man, Back in the uh, or, what, about mid 70s, I'm still young. Uh, the uh, country people were were politically active, a uh, lot lot more than they are today, especially young people. Um, you know, maybe it's because the cost of college tuition is so high nowadays. But uh, I just uh, didn't understand how come young people aren't out there. You know, 
and I've been arrested here in the streets of San Francisco uh, for the death of the Democratic Convention a few times. I've been arrested for a lot of protests. Um, never gotten in any trouble over it. Anyways, getting back to Occupy, um, what we're trying to achieve with Occupy is at least try to level the playing field for people a little bit. You know, uh, my number one demand, if the Occupy is going to make a demand, I hate this, this mic's going to ring. My, uh, my number one demand would be to uh, have the corporations pay their taxes. I don't think that that's an unreasonable thing. Um, I'm an anarchist myself, and I don't really believe in this economic system. I think that it's pretty much set up to keep the rich people rich and the poor people poor. And if you really look at what we have today, we're actually living in a feudal system. This is like neo-feudalism, because you have a few people that control most of the economic wealth in this country and around the world, and it's just like the Middle Ages, where a few kings and a few of the nobility controlled all the wealth, and the rest of us were serfs. So there's really not that much different, and we really haven't made that much progress since the Middle Ages. So uh, you might want to think about that. Uh, but I, anyway, I'm very active. I uh, live stream all the time. I'm involved with IT. Um, I write software. I, I like, really, what I really enjoy the most is teaching young people how to leverage technology and how to make a life for themselves once they've uh, figured out maybe what, their, what path that they want to go on because, uh, you know, it's really hard for young people today. It's really hard for them to find work or any kind of place to live. Uh, and so I'm there. I'm, I'm kind of like uh, the old uncle who you can go to and if you need a place to stay or a few bucks or you, want, you need some help with your uh, website or, you know, I'm there for you. Um, and it gives me a lot of pleasure. I'd rather some young people do really well. It's more important to me um, than myself because, you know, I'm already a success. I don't really have any problems in this world and the world I'm glad to lead a charm life. Well, I've been going around the country to different occupies. Um, specifically, I went to D.C., uh, Philadelphia, Baltimore, New York, and I got a chance to talk with a bunch of people there about what they're trying to achieve. And, um, and here in San Francisco as well. And at first, I was kind of like upset by the fact that our Occupy San Francisco movement split off into different factions. And then I had to recall my anarchist training of the books that I've read, and had, because they don't teach anarchy in schools. I mean, you can't go to school and get a historical course to learn about Emma Goldman, Alexander Berkman, uh, Derudi. I mean, there's lots and lots of anarchists throughout history, but they don't teach that in school at all. So you have to kind of educate yourself. Um, so I went back to my anarchist theory and, and stuff like that. I've written a few books about anarchist theory. And uh, I looked at, the, looked at the Occupy breaking up, and I'm like, you know what, this is a really good thing. It's not so bad after all. Um, you know, we don't have this one centralized body to deal with anymore. And there's not all these people that you have to deal with all the time. And now we have these smaller groups and people actually get a chance to talk when, at the small meetings, you know, because there's not as many people. So there's not this big, like, competitive rush just, get, just to put your two cents in. So in reality, when people are organizing that I found in my world, um, it's better to have smaller groups because then more people have a chance to get something to say. So the fact that our Occupy here in San Francisco is split up in smaller groups has actually been a blessing. And um, one of the most positive things that's come about it is that now there's all these different groups that are doing things here in the city and around the country as well because uh, San Francisco and New York and D.C. and all the major cities are all basically a microcosm of what's going on here or in New York. I mean, you could... You could take the people that are down here at the Federal Reserve and take them to D.C. or take them to New York, and the exact same thing is happening politically, sociologically, and economically. So, um, uh, so it's not that much different. And that was kind of like, uh, I thought that was kind of interesting and that, that in New York that all the groups have managed to split off from each other, and uh, D.C. as well. And, uh, and the same thing was happening here. So. Mike, so I'll stop there. So I just uh, spinning off of Clark's uh, statement, um, Jane. Can you talk about from your perception of where Occupy is now and um, why? A very tough question. I've spent a long time answering this question to so many people. Which spin do you want? <laughs> okay. Um, so. 
back when Occupy started, it was one big camp. You could just come over and just join in. And that was the whole power of the camps. Whatever anybody says, they, um, the reason that the camps were destroyed is not because of any of the issues that were there or it, it was messy. I actually lived in the camps. I stayed at 101 Market in front of the Federal Reserve and I went to work every day. So I slept at night in the tent and I would go, I have a full-time job and I would go to work every day and I would come back. It was orderly enough for me to do that. So whatever anybody says, it's not any of the internal things that happened at the camps. The reason they were eradicated is because they were a threat. The reason they were a threat is because anybody could come there. That was the meeting point for all of these activists and people to start plugging in. I used to work at the welcome table all the time whenever I would be at the camp sitting there. I'd sit at the welcome table and talk to There were tourists. There were all these kinds of people walking by and my favorite story is when there was this woman who came over and she was in her um you know she looks like a typical soccer mom really and she came over and she said okay i want to know what you guys are about because i'm terrified that we're going to go to war with iran and i don't know what to do about it so what do i do Right? So she knew that she was very unhappy with something that was happening, and now where do you go? Oh, you just go to Occupy. So this is very, very, very dangerous to the powers that be. So of course they crushed it. There was a coordinated attack throughout the nation to crush these camps because of that reason. They were a hotbed of political activity. And after the camps were eradicated, that forced, um, that forced us as activists to start to organize in different and new ways. And so we continued to hold the General Assembly, but because there were no camps, um, the General Assembly started getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and people started going into different groups. And for a while there, it was still kind of okay, and then there was a reoccupation at 101 Market. And at that point, um, the people that were sleeping out there on the streets, there was there was a rift, right? Because some people thought, well, you shouldn't go and reoccupy, and some people said you should. And so um, some of the campers started resenting the other activists who weren't staying there. And because of that, some people decided, well, we don't want to go to this General Assembly. I mean, we don't want to you know, do stuff here. And so Occupy San Francisco as an entity um, became unwieldy in the sense, well, where do you pass things, right? So we, we had a General Assembly. If you want to make a statement as Occupy San Francisco, you would go to the General Assembly and try to get the statement passed, right? But as, when there's no more General Assembly or people no longer see the validity of the General Assembly, how can you make statements as a group? You can't. And so that's when organizing really went into separate groups. So we have an environmental justice working group. We have, for example, my ideological liberation working group that I'm a part of. We have um, the Action Council. We have um, Occupy Berno, which focuses on foreclosures and things like that. And um, for that reason, in order to keep this cohesive center and in order to keep a general assembly, we created Occupy Bay Area United. Now, um, with the... Uh, so I, I want to really talk to you guys about two different, very important San Francisco Occupy groups. And they are Occupy Bay Area United and Occupy SF Action Council. So the Action Council started when there are still were camps and Occupy SF, and it's a way for um, groups such as labor groups or affinity groups or different groups around the city to plug into Occupy Actions. So it's a spokes council. And they make, and their whole thing is to make large actions. So for example, the S17 action where people were walking around here, that was all created by the action council. And that meets Sundays 2 to 4 at Local 2 on 209 Golden Gate. But that's a spokes council, right? So if you're just um, a person, they do welcome individuals, but it's not the direct kind of participatory democracy that you know, the, the General Assemblies um, were fostering. And so that kind of stuff is still happening at um, Occupy Bay Area United. 
Now, the thing with Occupy Bayway United is it was an offshoot of um, some people who decided that after what happened in the mission on April 30th, do you guys know what happened in the mission on April 30th? So there were some people dressed in black who went in the mission and started smashing up windows in small businesses. They also started yelling things like, Occupy, 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 which was obviously a plant, right? Because this was not an Occupy activity. This was not an Occupy group. I was very um, active in Occupy at the time. I was on a communications um, group at Occupy San Francisco. And so as soon as that happened, we, we put out a statement saying, you know, we really believe that these are aging provocateurs. We denounce what is happening here. Um, then there was a statement written um, about wh what transpired as a thing that said, this is not us. This is not Occupy SF. And we presented it at a general assembly at Occupy San Francisco. And at this general assembly, they said there were about 60 people there. And there was two blocks. And a block means that I have a moral objection to this statement. So there was a statement saying, you know, this is not us. We didn't do anything like this. We really feel for you people in the mission. And we really do think that we're nonviolent. And then two people blocked the other 60 people at this General Assembly, their will. And out of that, because of the frustration that in Occupy San Francisco, you can't make a decision unless it's unanimous. Out came, and also because there wasn't a specific nonviolence stance, which also couldn't be made, only because you needed it to be unanimous. A new organization was formed, which is Occupy Bay Area United, and the first thing it did is make a nonviolent statement and say, and, and a 90% consensus model. Now, the, but it has grown into something a lot bigger because Occupy San Francisco and Action Council are all focused on San Francisco. But what Occupy Bay Area United did is it went, it does its general assemblies one, uh, alternating weeks, San Francisco and Oakland. And in this way, it has finally started bridging Oakland and San Francisco together. And so now we will have there are possibilities of broad um, Bay Area actions. You would be surprised at how um, insular Occupy Oakland versus Occupy San Francisco was, and still is. Um, so um, one of the blocks to um, Occupy's growth has been the um, influence of the police. Um, how do you think uh, Occupy can grow in the face of um, what's going to be obviously con uh, the continual presence of police interference? Um, well, he says the police are our biggest obstacle. Um, I disagree. I think that the politicians who control the police and the business people who order the police are the biggest obstacle. I had an opportunity in New York to, to talk to a lot of New York police officers about Occupy, about their pensions, about uh, their health benefits and their eight hour day and things like that, which come as a direct result of the anarchist movement here in the United States. And uh, I would say that about nine out of 10 police officers do support the goals and aims of Occupy. Um, they're under orders, um, they took the job, um, but I am not angry with them as police officers. Um, I found that I can talk to them. As a live streamer, I found that when they're making arrests, I usually like to be right up on the scene when they're making the arrest to make sure nobody gets hurt so I can get that person's name who was getting arrested, um, especially uh, recently when I was in New York. And if anybody's interested, I brought up some playing cards here from New York. These are, uh, these are Occupy playing cards. And people were getting arrested in New York for tossing one of those out in the street, which is a casino chip, uh, to signify that Wall Street basically is just a big casino where people go gamble their money. And, uh, uh, there's really no difference. So as far as the police here in San Francisco go, um, I found that they're not the problem. The problem is, is Mayor Ed Lee, um, who many of you probably supported, um, because he was the one that gives the orders. He's the boss of the police force here in town, not the police chief, Mayor Ed Lee. And the police serve at his pleasure. It's the same way it works with Obama. Obama is the commander-in-chief of the United States military. They serve at his pleasure. So. As far as the police goes, basically, um, you know, it's really easy to like scapegoat them for being 
like uh, because they're the ones that have to do the dirty work. They do society's dirty work, basically. So it's really easy to scapegoat them as being our enemy. Um, when I just know that when I'm talking with police officers, and I'm a very observant person, and as a live streamer, I usually follow whoever's in command so I can hear his radio and know where the police are going to be. So um, I would say that uh, they actually have gone out of their way, a lot of the police officers, to be courteous and nice. And, and not every not every cop, there's some, to be sure, who are violent. But for the most part, most of them don't even want to be there. Uh, so that's, you know, and I really hate it that our, our whole movement is being framed in this debate uh, between us and the police department because the police department is part of the 99% too. And I don't really want to make it about the police department. I want to make it about the uh, oligarchs who control all of the wealth in, in the world. And that's where the real issue lies, um, is them. You know, we need to get to those people because, you know, when you have 700 people on Earth that control more wealth than 7 billion people on the planet, well, then something's really seriously wrong with our political and economic systems. When one person can control everybody else through their wealth. So, I always try to get along with police officers, even though sometimes I'm ideologically opposed to them. I've been involved with, I'm a medical cannabis patient, and I've had many run-ins with the police department, not personally, but people that I know. And I've spent uh, the last, or I spent the 10 years, I guess, from the early, early late 90s to the early 2000s, uh, getting people out of jail for medical cannabis. And one thing that I had to do, which was part of doing that, was uh, exposing uh, narcotics officers who were busting people for marijuana, so for medical marijuana. So, um, so I come to good know many, a great many police officers and a great many lawyers and judges through this time. And you would think that somebody who is, believes in that and anarchy so much, how could I even talk to a judge or, or a police officer or a lawyer? Well, um, there has to be some kind of order in society somewhere. And, uh, and, and dealing with them, these, these people, that they're just trying to make a living and they're trying to do the best jobs that they can too. So I'm not gonna hold it against them. But our, um, our organizing efforts are not against the police. Yeah, I, don't want to go too long. I can talk about this all day. So. <laughs> so I wanted to mention something about the police that's kind of interesting is because I have actually evolved my thinking. This is something that changed for me by my involvement with Occupy about the police. I really firmly believe that police, they're people too. And real revolution will happen when they stop following orders, right? If their orders are to somehow suppress the people in the streets. But what my eyes have been open to is um, actually how the police do treat different communities differently. Like we can all sit here and talk about, oh, the police protect us and they're people too, but they're not killing our children, right? So only when I started going into Oakland and like helping certain groups with like the Alan Bluford movement and other young black men that have been killed because they are not white. And having talking to these people really changed my mind about how different communities view the police. It hasn't changed how necessarily I view the police, but I've come to understand why they view the police differently. So remember that in San Francisco and in Oakland, the situation's completely different. When we walk on marches here and the police are very nice, they allow us to like do a lot more stuff than when you go to Oakland, it's already like the tension, you feel it in the air. And so that's very important to understand. And it's just something that has, I don't know, I've changed my mind about, because I always was like, well, why, why are they all going and fighting with the police but it's so antagonistic already when you see this like happen in front of your eyes it's very different okay then i guess it's time to um open up the audience for questions do we have anybody who wants to uh, ask our powerless something just for just real quick. if you really want to if you really want to do something to change the economic situation here in this country, like if you want to make a uh, like a, a direct like contribution to what's going on, nah, just, um, one of the things you could do is not shop and buy things and go into debt. And uh, that's like, the, can, can you guys hear me all right? Give okay, me, I need the mic. All right, maybe I do need the mic. I'm sorry. I usually can speak. 
if I've worked at this for many years, I'm in the big jerk. Uh, just real short, one of the things you can do if you really want to not contribute to the situation on Wall Street and all that good stuff, what it is, uh, all it is, I'm pretty sure most of you people here are renters, maybe a couple of you are fortunate enough to own your own houses. Uh, beyond that, uh, basically I can tell you, don't shop, don't spend your money, don't go into debt on crappy loans where you have to pay a lot of interest, don't like overmatch your credit cards, buy something within your means, um, and don't be uh, a consumer, just try not to participate in that. And that's like a first way that normal people can make a real contribution to change the situation here in this country or around the world. Because every time you buy something or use something here, um, you're taking a toll on the earth. So, and then the earth has to pay for it, not the Wall Street bankers. So, uh, just consider that if you like, if you're really considering to make a, a change. Thanks. Hi, I don't want to create uh, club members, but I just want to ask you kind of a general kind of how do you feel about it question, because I think, you know, Occupy has just had such a profound um, impact on how we talk about certainly inequality in, in the power relationships, and I think um, between folks who have money and folks who don't, and I think it would be wonderful if you could tell us what kind of a new economic future we're moving towards, but I don't think that's necessarily your responsibility. Um, I think we're in a transitional, a very transitional moment in terms of culture and economy. You know, you guys are helping a lot, um, and, and I just personally appreciate what, what you've done. But you know what strikes me being here in San Francisco, I mean, so I'm looking at, you know, Lloyd Blankfein and Angelo Mozillo and, you know, Jamie Dimon and all those guys. And they're a problem, but, you know, we're here in San Francisco where the folks who are on the cutting edge of a new kind of economy and are the wealthy people who are, well, I don't know, and are the wealthy people who are making it difficult for the rest of us to afford to live here, aren't that guys? You know, they're the IT tech people who are, you know, spending their entire life working at Twitter and Google and, um, well, I would it's, say it's just an, uh, and it's true here in San Francisco and New York. Uh, I just wonder how you kind of feel about being in the middle of this kind of culture where most of the people who are getting very wealthy and seem to be edging the rest of us out from places to live, et cetera, are, are you know, folks who are succeeding in doing good tech jobs and stuff, we probably think if they weren't doing it for these corporations, would be doing good work. Well, I think you brought up a good point about the cards. Um, we do have another card that, most of these people are in New York, because you know, most billionaires live in New York, but the second largest concentration of billionaires right here in San Francisco. And actually, we do have one card that I didn't bring today, which is of Richard Blum. Richard Blum is my favorite financial criminal because he's local. And um, he is the husband of our Diane Feinstein. He's also a UC regent. And he uses his position as UC regent in order to crush public education. Because guess what? Where are his investments? In for-profit universities. So he gets the UC portfolio, the public UC portfolio, to buy up for-profit universities. The UC portfolio endowment has holdings in for-profit universities. How horrible is that? So um, we definitely have our very own criminals. And as far as, I'm not sure, the thing is with the tech stuff is there's a lot of horrible things going on there as well. And what that has to do with is not even this whole, because I think what you're talking about is a gentrification issue, but it's much more of a venture capital, um, just taking over the whole economy issue. The thing is that what we've had is this, um, the reason that it's harder for people in uh, to live in San Francisco and the Bay Area as a whole is because the whole, all of society has become more unequal. And so we all feel this. That's because there has been cuts to public education. There have been cuts to public services, public health care. Even the post offices are getting shut down. I mean, 
all of these equalizers are being taken out and then we get this um, step ladder thing that's way more unequal. And so then you see all these people in the tech industry. But guess what? All these like high tech people, most of them are not from America. That's because the Americans have stopped being able to raise these types of um, math and, uh, and science education. And that's really unfortunate because we really need to get back to that kind of stuff so that we can have our students at go to City College of San Francisco instead of getting that shut down, right? And so, I mean, even the, the reason I can say this is I am a math person myself, right? I am in the tech industry myself. And the reason that I was able to do math and get through it is because my parents did math. And the reason my parents did math is because they're from Russia. Right? So, well, say what you will about communism, but there are certain things that the state should do. And one of those is education. And so if we actually did do our education properly, then we would have people, a more equal nation, and people would be able to afford to live in San Francisco instead of seeing this horrible inequality. Sorry, that was really um, As someone who's an IT guy, um, and I live, in, uh, I live on 6th Street, um, can say that uh, I hated all the idiots that came here back in the turn of the century. Uh, it was a big pain in the butt for me because I had to deal with all these people thought that I was one of those people who was rude and obnoxious and whatever. So, uh, but the reason mainly why it's very expensive to live here in San Francisco is that we, this is such a beautiful city. And when people come here, they come here from all around the world, they end up staying here and they end up wanting to live here. And recently we've had an influx of people from China once Chinese uh, opened up their uh, borders to let uh, their citizens out of their country. So there's massive waves of immigration that have been coming into San Francisco over the last 30 years. There's been a lot of Russian Jews, a lot of Chinese, um, people from all different nationalities that look to San Francisco and the United States as a beacon of hope in a world where that nobody has any hope. And people that are in the real estate game um, see that they can make a lot of money by exploiting these people and exploiting the IT people. And they're not only exploiting those people, but they're also exploiting you all out there because you have to pay extra money in taxes and whatever, even if you own your own home, and for basic city services. So, um, when we're talking about seven billion people here on the planet, um, you can't blame it on them so much as you can blame it on them. At least now we know who the cause of the problem is here in society. At least we know that those 700 people, it's probably a lot more, but you know, we're just narrowing it down just for the sake of conversation. So. Um, those are the people that basically own most of the things in the world, just about all of it. So, they like to pit us off against each other, and uh, they like to place, you know, divide and conquer. That's pretty much been their political strategy for the last 3,000 years or better. So, uh, the best thing that we can do is unite and talk to your neighbors and friends and get them, you know, to support whatever you're doing politically. Um, this is a Democratic club, right? Am I, am I not mistaken? Nonpartisan Democrat. So, get out there and organize. Okay, do we have other questions? Okay, Max? Amongst the groups that you have, the working groups you have in Occupy, do you have one that goes over his, the historical role of government in crushing movements? Because I think what as you go through history and you read things that have gone on, the labor movement, the women's suffrage movement, I mean, any movement in the United States of America, the government response has basically been the same, civil rights movement. It's get somebody out there to make the group look bad, destroy the group from within by sending people in to either snitch on them or, or make it look as if they're snitching on them, and basically discredit the group within the United States so people turn away from things that are good for them. Do you have a working group within Occupy that deals with these sorts of things and can respond when you start to see them happening? Like the guys who went into the mission and tore it up. Guys or women, whoever. We don't really have a formal group that's dealing with history because most of the people that come into our group um, from Occupy are not as first in history as somebody like myself 
I used to work at the Bound Together Books up on the Haight, and part of the reason I worked up there was so I could get access to all the, they have a wonderful library of uh, anti-authoritarian and anarchist books there, which are generally you can't find anywhere. But uh, I was at that night when we were, uh, when all the shenanigans went on in the Mission District, and I can pretty much tell you 99% cert certain that it was somebody hired by Wells Fargo that went out and did the actions, because I was up there and I've been around this town since 1981. And I've been involved in any important social movement or anything that's been important in the city for many, many years. And I generally can pick out at least five to ten people that I know personally for many years at a demonstration. And um, I didn't know anybody. And I'm like, I don't know anybody here. i got to get going. I'm going to leave, man. This is kind of weird. I don't know anybody here. And uh, so I left. And I was like, as we were, as I had a friend of mine was pushing my chair for me, as I'm leaving, I'm like, and I was pointing out all the different places that were going to get uh, trashed that night. And, and sure enough, every one of them was destroyed. So one of the things about living here in the United States that's that, as opposed to like a place like Spain, where they have a long tradition of anti-authoritarianism against the government, well, people remember history there, and people in the United States, unfortunately, I have to continuously remind people about history in this country. So there you go. Well, we have something called Occupy Forum, and that's every Monday night, and it happens 6 to 9 p.m. every Monday night at uh, Justin Herman Plaza, but we like to call it Bradley Manning Plaza, where the big, large encampment of Occupy San Francisco was. And last, last night, they had a forum on the history of anarchism and organizing and how they were infiltrated and all these things as well. And so, um, yes, we have many, we don't have a formal working group that would deal with something like this. However, people are vigilant. And we actually have lots of really smart people. Um, I was actually very, very excited when I got to Occupy because I, no other social setting, including grad school, have I seen so many smart kids or people in general, of all generations, actually. And so um, one of the guys that was doing the, uh, the presentation last night, he actually teaches anarchist uh, history at the only cooperative high school in the Bay Area. So we do have people who are experts in that. We do have people who are vigilant in that. And we have people who are really great organizers. So we try to. You know, but we're all not professional. This is all vol volunteer based. So we try to do the best we can, right? And that's all we can hope to do. Okay, do we have a last uh, quick question? Okay. All right, um, let's give a round of applause to uh, our speakers. By the way, for all you people out there, if you see me on the street, you can, uh, you can uh, tweet me at, at Freeman Sullivan. I'm always happy to answer your questions or any kind of concerns that you have about uh, social movements here and around the country. Uh, if you want to get involved, you can contact me. I'll be happy to point you out to a place where you might want to get involved in doing something that might be of interest to you. Um, uh, I'm always happy to do that for people and, uh, and get them going because uh, I can't do this job all by myself, you know. I'm a pretty smart guy. I know a lot about politics, but it takes every one of you out here, everybody, to participate and to basically take responsibility for the way the situation is here in society. Um, uh, thanks a lot for having me as a guest. And uh, like I said, anytime, tweet me at Freeman Sullivan. And one of the nice things about Occupy that's been so great is that I've got to meet people like Jane, all the young people in our society. Because I, to be honest with you, I had given up on the younger generation. I'm like, right, where are they? Right? Right. Thank you very, very much. Please give them a round of applause. Thank you. So what we've done here tonight is gotten some information about what's going on with the health system and what's going on with Planned Parenthood and what's going on with the unions. And I think one of the threads that runs through it as far as areas that politicians feel that they can attack is areas where there's a large, there are a large concentration of women. It's like, okay, they're women, so we can say what we want, and we can do what we want. Because many women 
were able to take, finally take care of themselves because of the unions and they were teachers. And normally or historically, the teachers have been women. There have been men in there, obviously, but a lot of women are involved in teaching. So the areas where the women, where women are most prevalent are the areas where they choose to attack, believing that will back off. Why they would believe that, I don't know. <laughs> right? <laughs> they seem to believe we'll back off. And I see some young people here younger than me. Personally, I'm going toward the do everything I can to save Medicare age. But I have great nieces who are going to need access to birth control, access to health care. Hopefully never, but you never know. Life has lots of surprises for one. Access to abortions. And I feel that my great nieces are going to be smart enough to make those decisions along with their doctors, and they don't need somebody who never is going to have that issue telling them what to do. So I believe there are many things we can get involved in, whether you decide to do it through the Occupy movement, or you decide to do it through Dr. Schaeffer's uh, group, or you're joining a union, but it's very important to get involved in doing something, because the person you're waiting for, why don't they take care of it? They is us and we have to take care of it. And we can't just let it go. Because we need to give people something. We have to leave something. We can't just use up everything and say, well, somebody else will do it. We have to do it. So again, I'm very happy you came here, but before you go, Tom has an announcement. Uh, just a quick announcement. One of our longtime members, his name is Alec Bash. Anyone know Alec Bash? He's now in charge of the Barack Obama for President headquarters in the Castro on Market Street, north side of Market, between, I think, Noe and Sanchez. You've probably passed by it. How many people know that there is actually an Obama headquarters right here, not just in San Francisco, but the Castro? Anyway, our own member, you saw Alec there. He was recruited by the local Democratic Party. Alec, would you please be basically the office manager? And that, that headquarters, that rented building, that rented store space, also is doing other camp, local campaigns. So if you're interested, just stop by and say hi to Alec. Okay, okay. and are there any other announcements that need to be made that somebody... Yeah. Want to say something? Quick. Quick. We're not part of the group. Quick. We have our general yes. assemblies. Yeah. Uh, if you want to find out and become more involved with Occupy, go to obau.org and there'll be a clearinghouse of information for you so you can plug into the movement. So it's obau.org. Thank and you. And I urge you to do that. You know, marching in the street is really kind of a nice thing. I mean, you get to see a lot of people, they look at you and say, why are you out here? And if it's a nice day, hey, you get your exercise in and you get a little sunshine. Right. So I urge you to get involved. If you like our group, please join it. We'd love to have you. Um, these uh, meetings, us as volunteers within the group, Basically, we're always looking for ideas for meetups. Um, we put it together ourselves if you want to get involved in doing something like that. Peter Wong is the person to uh, talk to about that. Because we love any ideas, because as I indicated, we love handing out information or passing along information. And please feel free to pass any information that you felt was great along to your friends and family. But again, thank you very much for coming. Have a wonderful evening and a safe trip home. Bye-bye. Um, Billy? Um, Billy, there's, you're, uh, you're wrong about Occupy being dead, because I just got back from a, a tour of the East Coast, and Occupy is very much alive, my friend. But uh, thanks for watching. Um, hey, thanks for, asking, thanks for asking me. I appreciate it. I am, like, totally, like, tired. <laughs> I haven't slept in, like, two weeks, like, more than five or six hours a night. Well, I'm getting healthy again. I'm, you know, I'm going to let all you guys go, all right? So you have a good night, and I'll be back.